Tonight, Alberta secures a federal promise of assistance as destructive wildfires hit people where they live. It's probably a little different when it's your home on the line. Firefighters are on the way. Will the weather cooperate? Persona non grata. Canada expels the diplomat at the center of reported interference by China. It shouldn't have taken the targeting of a member of parliament uh, to make this decision. The demise of a once popular diet brand, losing out to new apps and new drugs. It could potentially have a big impact on the behavioral approach to weight loss. This is The National with Anita Bath. Good evening. Adrian is on assignment. Let's start in Alberta tonight, where raging wildfires are stirring up a mix of fear and uncertainty. To help fight the battle, the province will get help from Ottawa, including military assistance. About 30,000 Albertans have now been driven from their homes. Others are nervously waiting to hear if they'll be next, while those returning to areas already consumed by the flames take stock of what remains. Roughly 90 active wildfires are burning across Alberta. More than two dozen are out of control and the situation could get worse. Huge areas are at varying degrees of risk after hot, dry weather turned parts of the province into kindling. But rain in the forecast is now bringing hope for some, including those affected by several fires west of Edmonton. That's where Julia Wong picks up the story. <laughs> Jason Wilkins has been working since Saturday. It's important to take this one down because the embers will get carried out into the green and that's not a good thing. To try and keep his family's property intact. It's probably a little different when it's your home on the line. Um, so I was pretty energized the whole time. By, Wildfire by the time destroyed his hay field. All you could see was red in the trees. Like you could just see where everything was still burning. It also destroyed some farm equipment, but it could have been much worse all because he and his neighbors banded together to beat back the flames. It's the grim reality of being out sort of this remotely. We had a lot of luck and a lot of neighbor help to make it through to get to today. It's a situation playing out across the province. Everyday Albertans and firefighters doing whatever they can to stop the wildfire in its tracks. We've got people with equipment and cats and tank trucks and uh, some of them are volunteering their time and their equipment to, to help out wherever they can and um, it's, it, it's a big deal. Unfortunately for some, it's too late. In some places, the earth is scorched beyond recognition. Homes, trailers, and other buildings destroyed. The heat so intense, this fridge and stove now charred rubble. Firefighters have arrived from Ontario and Quebec and soon Manitoba. Crews are also expected from the United States. Plus, that promised military support from the federal government. I would anticipate that as soon as they're ready and as soon as the, the, um, the emergency command center is willing to or is able to integrate them, they will. Wilkins was two hours away when the wildfire started. Coming back to save his family home was a no-brainer. This place is pretty important to me and been three generations of, of farming here, so I'd like to, uh, I'd like to make sure it's protected. And Julia, the province is also asking for volunteers to help battle these fires. Yeah, they are. Anyone who is trained and qualified in firefighting and who wants to volunteer is being asked to reach out. The province will then assess their abilities and then see what type of role they could play in this firefight. And what's the weather supposed to be like in the coming days? So right now, temperatures are a little bit cooler and we've seen some light rain in parts of the province, but we are not out of the woods yet. Temperatures are expected to rise later this week and there are worries that could cause these wildfires to flare up again. Thanks, Julia. The exact role the military will play hasn't been spelled out, but the premier says she has been assured nearby troops have the proper training. Princess Patricia Canadian Light Infantry do have uh, 300 people trained in some firefighting, so that will help since they're close to home and they'll also be putting out a call to their reservists who also have firefighting training. And so we may be able to have some local Premier Smith notes that at least 450 members of Northern Alberta Indigenous communities are trained in firefighting. She also announced financial assistance of $3,500 for each family of four evacuated. While the Prime Minister says Ottawa is ready to step up too. 
I assured Danielle that we will be there to help. Um, we talked a lot about the different ways the federal government can help and we will be uh, working to make sure that we're supporting Albertans uh, right across the province as necessary. The Prime Minister also says Ottawa will match donations to the Red Cross. The opposition has been demanding government action for days. Today, they finally got it. A diplomat from China will soon be on his way out of Canada, expelled after reports he targeted the family of a Canadian MP. Rafi Bujikanian has the details. The pressure built for days. The Prime Minister is so courageous, he might throw out Beijing's agent. The demand for the expulsion of a diplomat from China, Zhao Wei, for the reported intimidation of Michael Chong's family in Hong Kong was not just from Chong's party. All parliamentarians need assurance that their safety, their family's safety and their freedom of expression are not threatened. The government said it wasn't so simple that it had to carefully weigh the consequences. Today, it did. Canada has declared the individual in question today, persona non grata. Our government has been clear we will not tolerate any form of foreign interference in our internal affairs. That decision a full week after the Globe and Mail named him, citing a confidential national security source and a nearly two-year-old CSIS document, it reported Zhao sought information on Chong's family after Chong voted for a motion condemning China's treatment of its minority Uyghur population. It shouldn't have taken the targeting of a member of parliament uh, to make this decision. Uh, we have known for years that the PRC is using its accredited diplomats here in Canada uh, to target Canadians and their families. The Prime Minister has said the CSIS report never made its way to his office, though it did go to civil servants and other government officials. I think it could have been done much faster, and much faster, in fact, goes back to 2021. Any indications of, of foreign interference that touch on MPs and the working of Parliament has to be considered, um, you know, something that e even if the initial information is sketchy, has to be pursued further. A government source says Zhao will have up to five days to leave the country. In the meantime, China's embassy has again called the allegations against them groundless and said it will take countermeasures, warning that Canada will face consequences. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Ottawa. Let's bring in David Cochran, the host of Power and Politics. So, David, we heard from Rafi there about potential consequences from China. What could those be? Yeah, that's the big question tonight, Anita. I mean, does China respond in a proportional way, kick out a diplomat in response and retaliation for Canada kicking out one of their diplomats? Or does China escalate this and maybe take economic actions against Canada, some trade sanctions potentially? And if that happens, how does Canada and its allies respond to that? I think the hope here in Ottawa is that it's proportional and you simply see a another diplomat uh, kicked out of China in response to this and it doesn't escalate to anything like we've seen in the difficult relations between the two countries over the last couple of years. But that statement from the Chinese embassy saying they will resolutely take countermeasures and all consequences shall be borne by the Canadian side. That's a pretty clear declaration of intent, but exactly what that looks like we just don't know at this point in time. Okay, so what impact do you think that this decision could actually have on the government? Well, politically, this has been a tough one for them. If you, you take the most charitable explanation, it was a week ago that the prime minister, the foreign affairs minister, the public safety minister learned about this diplomat's activities. And tonight he has been declared persona non grata. The less charitable explanation is that this was in the hands of key advisors in the government, top officials in the government in the summer of 2021 and no action until now. How that happened, why there was a breakdown, that is still a question that deserves a clear explanation. Thanks, David. Thank you. The man who threw gravel at Justin Trudeau during his 2021 federal campaign tour has been sentenced to 90 days of house arrest and a year of probation. His goal now is to find a way to deal with his emotions uh, through counseling and to make sure that something like this never happens ever again. The judge described Shane Marshall's actions as mob mentality and anti-democratic. The incident happened in London, Ontario, when Marshall was a one-time People's Party of Canada Writing Association president. A Toronto landlord is demanding changes after her condo was used as an Airbnb without her knowledge. As Ryan Patrick Jones tells us, the person who registered the Airbnb wasn't even her tenant. Allison Riskina was moving in with her new husband, so she rented out her Toronto condo. Earlier this year, she was told by the property manager that the condo was being rented on Airbnb. 
something both she and the condo board didn't allow. It was like the bottom dropped out of my stomach. It's like she's in my condo that just as an enterprise, not as a home. And so that was a really awful feeling. Riskina went online and found her condo had been listed repeatedly. The person listing it wasn't her tenant. It was someone she'd never even heard of. Knowing that you've been lied to and your trust has been violated has been a very jarring experience. The tenant told CBC News it was her boyfriend who listed the condo on Airbnb and said she was unaware it wasn't allowed. The City of Toronto gave the boyfriend approval. The city says renters only need to show photo ID that lists the address as their principal residence. There is sometimes additional follow-up. Riskina says that's not good enough. They need to either ask for a lease, um, call the landlord, um, ask for proof of ownership, reach out to the property manager. When Riskina tried to evict the tenant for breaching the lease terms, the tenant asked for $6,000 to leave. Demands like that are becoming increasingly common, according to this paralegal who's representing Riskina. All landlords know that the quickest way for them to get the tenant out is doing a cash for keys, meaning that they pay them X amount of money and they vacate commonly within 30 to 60 days. There are backlogs at landlord-tenant dispute boards across the country, where wait times for hearings balloon during the pandemic. Airbnb says it's taken down the listing for Riskina's condo and she has come to a settlement with her tenant. But the dispute has cost her thousands of dollars in legal fees and unpaid rent. And she says she now plans to sell her condo. Ryan Patrick Jones, CBC News, Toronto. We have updates tonight in a pair of tragic stories from Texas. It just feels like no matter where we are, safe neighborhoods, we're not, we're not safe anymore here in America. This was the scene today outside a shopping mall north of Dallas where a gunman shot and killed eight people yesterday, including three children. The shooter was killed by police. Now, there are reports the 33-year-old used an AR-15 rifle, held extremist beliefs, and had links to white supremacy groups. Further south in the state... Through the investigation, it was found that the SUV ran a red light, lost control, flipped on its side, and struck a total of 18 individuals. The driver of that vehicle, a 34-year-old, is now facing eight manslaughter charges. Ten others were injured, many of them migrants from Venezuela. It happened yesterday in the Texas border town of Brownsville. Police have not ruled out a targeted attack. Ukrainian officials say Russian cruise missiles, shelling and waves of suicide drones have hammered the country over the past 24 hours, including the capital. Today was one of the massive attacks to our hometown. 36 Russian drones closed in on Kyiv, causing no deaths, according to the city's mayor. But debris still sprayed buildings with shrapnel. We've been at war for a year, says this witness. It is always scary, but not as scary as on the front line. That front line still rages, medics rushing to save lives. The longest battle in the war so far over Bakhmut remains unfinished. At last report, Ukraine still holds a handful of city blocks. The city hiding the human cost in the smoldering rubble. But Russia is focused on what's to come. Showing off its defenses in the south as it forces civilians out and digs in, awaiting an attack. The time and place of Kyiv's counter-offensive remains a closely guarded secret. Well, it's a coronation hangover of sorts today. Time to clean up. And there were lots of volunteers pitching in to what's been dubbed the big help out. Chris Brown on the work to create an enduring legacy after an historic weekend. If Sunday's coronation concert was the big night out, make sure we don't pick up any broken glass with the pickers. The day after was billed as the big help out. It's a public holiday here, and the royals are encouraging people to spend just a little bit of their free time helping out. Volunteering within your community is being touted as one of the lasting legacies of the coronation. I, I think it was really great that the coronation has such an emphasis on service. Colin Cooper is with a charity trying to create healthier urban ecosystems, an issue the King has advocated for frequently. Does it feel to you that Britain has entered a new era with King Charles? I think so. I'm looking forward to it. So King Charles, obviously, is very pro-environment uh, and has been all of his life. 
Over 50,000 events were planned across the UK, with some royals pitching in too, including little Prince Louis, the youngest child of William, got to work the controls of a digger at a scout camp. So, uh, if The king and queen were not out today, surprise. but in a royal first, they did make a surprise cameo on the US TV show American Idol. Because I just wanted to check um, how, much, how long you'll be using this room for. <laughs> Lionel Richie and Katy Perry, who headlined the coronation concert, are both judges on the program. Meanwhile, London police are facing criticism for how they handled anti-monarchy protesters. Some were arrested on Saturday under a new Public Order Act before they could even start protesting. There was no grounds for arresting us and uh, it is a, an affront to democracy, an attack on our rights. But Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said he's grateful to the police. The police are operationally independent of government. They'll make these decisions based on what they think is best. The arrests were one of the few notes of coronation controversy. In a statement released to mark the end of the weekend, the king and queen offered their heartfelt thanks for making it such a special occasion. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. Mark Lalonde is being remembered tonight as a giant of Canadian politics. During the October crisis of 1970, Lalonde was chief of staff to Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. Lalonde was Minister of Health when he issued the influential Lalonde Report in 1974. It emphasized a healthy lifestyle and disease prevention. As Energy Minister, he spearheaded the National Energy Program, which was deeply unpopular in Alberta. Mark Lalonde was 93. Well, the Liberal government says it would never limit freedom of the press. This after a policy resolution passed at the party's national convention that is raising concerns about censorship. Ashley Burke has more. Okay, the motion is adopted. The resolution passed with no debate on the final day of the Liberal convention. There is a problem and it's essential to us, to our democracy, that it must be addressed. But what Liberal members voted is now raising alarm bells. It's a dangerous proposal. It's one that we would see, I think, in far more repressive regimes. It isn't appropriate in, in a country like Canada. The policy resolution requests the government explore options to hold online information services accountable for the veracity of material published on their platforms and to limit publication only to material whose sources can be traced. The Liberal Party member who wrote the proposal says her goal was to target disinformation posted anonymously online. I'm not asking journalists to reveal their own, you know, private sources, but the journalist has to be accountable for what their sources give them. She says she's not concerned about what she calls reputable journalists, but that doesn't comfort critics. It's not up to the government to decide who's a good journalist and who's a bad journalist and establish new standards or new regulations to those journalists that are seen as not good. On Parliament Hill, the Conservative Heritage critic called the Liberal resolution disheartening. I, I truly believe that as Canadians, we have to hold one another accountable. The moment we invite the state to do that or mandate that the state should do that, we now have state-run media. We now have state censorship. The state will determine what is true and what is not true. The resolution is non-binding, which means the government has the option of ignoring it altogether. The Heritage Minister's office said that the Liberal government will never implement a policy that limits freedom of the press, but wouldn't say if it will outright reject the proposal. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. A once popular weight loss company is shutting its doors. And I just had the feeling that something was happening. Why Jenny Craig struggled to compete against new diet trends. Some companies are demanding employees return to the office. Five days a week I'm, uh, I'm in the office now. This is actually my first time in office today. Is working from home coming to an end? and a dramatic rescue after a house goes up in flames. It was a very close call for sure, getting them out of that small window. We're back in two. Tonight, there's a major shift in the weight loss industry. After 40 years, Jenny Craig confirms it's shutting down its North American operations, a decline that's happened alongside the rapid rise of a popular drug. Sophia Harris is looking at what's shaking up the diet scene. A closed Jenny Craig caught customer Anna DeBiase off guard. Still, she's not surprised. 
it seemed like uh, customer service was lacking, and I just had the feeling that something was happening. Jenny Craig has shut down all 500 locations in the U.S. and Canada and filed for bankruptcy. The Canadian weight loss service industry generated more than $350 million in revenue last year, up 5% from 2021. My net diary displays results as you type. But the market is getting crowded with competitors like free do-it-yourself diet apps. Today, consumers, they can find for free information on how to design their own uh, dieting plan. Another disruptor? Diabetes drugs like Ozempic and Mount Gero, which are known as an effective treatment for obesity by stimulating weight loss. This new class of drugs out there is really having a big impact uh, and, and, and could potentially have a big impact going forward over the next couple of years on the behavioral approach to weight loss. It's so easy to use. At risk for diabetes, DeBiase has been prescribed Ozempic. She believes the drug's growing popularity may have caused Jenny Craig to lose some business. It's a better option, I think. You feel like you need to eat less because you can't eat a full meal, which is good. Starting is easy. Weight loss chain Weight Watchers has been suffering from declining revenue and membership numbers. But its stock recently soared after the company bought Sequence, a telehealth provider that can prescribe drugs like Ozempic. Weight loss app Noom is piloting a similar program. This obesity expert has received funding from Ozempic's owner. He says it and similar drugs are effective for fighting obesity, but warns it's not a quick fix solution. It's for people who meet the medical criteria for its use. Uh, certainly, I think people who go on medications for any chronic condition should expect to be on them long term. Weight Watchers and Noom say drugs aren't appropriate for all clients as there's no one size fits all solution to weight loss. Sophia Harris, CBC News, Toronto. The Bank of Canada is asking Canadians to join the conversation as it explores the possibility of a digital currency. A digital dollar would have all of the same features that you think of when you think of cash in your wallet. We have no plan to get rid of cash. So this isn't an exercise in replacing anything. It's really more an exercise of adding something. The central bank says that while there's no current need, it is getting ready for the future. Canadians are being asked to share their ideas about different aspects of the design. The online survey runs until June 19th. And one of Canada's largest employers, Royal Bank, has recently called employees back to the office for three to four days a week. Other companies are doing or have already done the same thing. Nisha Patel looks at the reasoning and the resistance. Packed trains, congested roads, crowded sidewalks. It's clear downtowns are getting busier. Five days a week I'm, uh, I'm in the office now. Well, I like to go every day. I'm an everyday guy. This is actually my first time in office today. Companies have been asking workers to return to their offices for months. Now some are demanding it. It's got its pros and its cons. Um, commute, got to get used to that again. I just think it's best for companies to give their employees a bit of flexibility there. Royal Bank is one of the latest big employers, now requiring employees to come in three to four days a week. The CEO saying they need to protect the bank's competitive edge. I think that the, the absence of working together in many ways has led to productivity and innovation challenges and society isn't back together enough uh, and, and working enough. After three years, the days of working from anywhere all the time may be ending for many office workers. Amazon and Lyft are moving from fully remote to hybrid models. Experts say employers need to ease people back in. You've got to give your employees sufficient notice and time to make necessary arrangements in order to come back to the workforce. Staff have been resisting the office push. Working from home can save time and money on commutes and offers better work-life balance. But there are reasons to show up in person. Young people are particularly disadvantaged by working from home all the time in that they're not getting the feedback from their manager. They're not getting the career development. With forecasts of a recession on the horizon, workers may not always have as much power to push back. But for now, experts say many still have options because of the tight labor market. The people who have a, a in-demand uh, job skill, you know, they're going to get what they want. And if they're not, they're going to walk and get it somewhere else. So working from home, at least some of the time, isn't going away soon. Nisha Patel, CBC News, Toronto. 
U.S. film and television writers are now in their second week on the picket lines. How it's impacting Canadian workers. It is very, very rough for both me and a lot of my film crew friends. But first, a tragic ending after Vancouver police tear down an encampment. When you're homeless, it's the really small things that matter, that really that are really important to you. And you only notice it when, when they're taken. The National takes you deeper into the stories shaping our world. Next. It's now been more than a month since Vancouver officials moved to clear a long-running tent encampment. That's refocused debate about Canada's homelessness crisis and the rights of those living on the margins at a time when more people are falling through the cracks. For people living on the edge in downtown Vancouver, survival itself is a full-time job. Tonight, Susanna Da Silva is showing that through the story of one man. The city of Vancouver tore down the encampment here on the downtown east side. We were left wondering, what happened to those people? Where did they go? Where did they shuffle their lives to? Where did they find shelter? Those questions eventually led us here, and to a room just up those stairs, an electrical closet actually, and a man who had learned to survive, having fallen through the cracks of a system that had failed him so many times before. <laughs> okay, uh, this is my home away from home, uh, home away from homeless. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a power electric room. Uh, it powers the block. It powers all the buildings and rooms in the block. An electrical uh, closet this, this, that for uh, several months gave Dino Bundy, office. or Boomer, as um, he's known. Right here, this here uh, turns off the lights and I got a little night light here a little bit of the stability he'd always wanted. I'm not really sure what power transformers do, but uh, they steadily hum. Uh, uh, it's kind of a comforting white noise uh, feeling once you get used to it. And as the days um, passed and no one came knocking, uh, like he I turned said, this into his home. This was uh, the uh, utility closet for the light bulbs. I turned it into a bed. Um, the tents, the tents, as you know, all the encampments, uh, once someone tears down a tent, it's like, uh, it's a free-for-all. So I basically come across my uh, sleeping bags and whatever else I need uh, through a decamped tent. How did you find this room? Uh, happenstance, uh, synchronicity. Uh, I just have a nose for that sort of stuff. How much do you worry that this won't last forever? Someone's gonna come. I'm concerned with that every day. So it's really, it's really tightrope uh, that you have to walk. And uh, I find that you're better off walking alone for the most part. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, I've, I've, I've been alone my whole life. I, I grew up in an orphanage. And I'm an orphan, so uh, yeah. Born to a black father and an indigenous mother, Boomer was orphaned at the age of five and sent to the Nova Scotia Home for Colored Children in the 1960s. The provincial government apologized in 2014 for abuses that occurred there. When you're homeless, it's the really small things that matter, that really that are really important to you. And you only notice it when, when they're taken, taken away. I had a, a beautiful bike, it got stolen. Every time I got a phone, it got stolen. So uh, I went to a Home Depot and uh, I, I, just, I just changed the deadbolt on this. I feel so much better now that I've got control of my ins and outs. And it's nice and tight and secure. Security uh, is something Boomer searched for, for another, his entire yeah. life. What was the job you were doing in Calgary? A uh, steel stud framer. He worked a stint in construction, but ended up on the streets. Drugs, he said, a way to deal with the pain life threw at him. I had to deal with a lot of racism, uh, a lot of uh, discrimination, a lot of uh, lower lower pay. And it was really frustrating. Um, and so yeah, I just got fed up with it to a certain point where I had to drop out because I just couldn't put up with, uh, with the struggle of uh, trying to maintain my dignity. Sixteen years ago, when a friend decided to head west, Boomer hitched along and ended up on Vancouver's downtown east side. 
where he quickly became an advocate for his community. All of a sudden, I hear this person singing, and I turned around, and there's Boomer dancing around, asking me what my name was in a song, and I answered him, and he started singing, Help Me, Rhonda, and then we started talking. And that was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. He would speak to me, ah, mahi, look, he would say to me, good morning, and I'd say, good morning. Rhonda Stevens of the Nishka Nation helps Indigenous residents find housing. She says Boomer was a tireless warrior, endlessly charismatic, and fought for others despite his own struggles. Boomer came from a place of pain. At the same time, I think of resiliency, goodness. How he turned his narrative into being able to help people understand that pain doesn't always have to hurt. You can make it into something good. Uh, My name is Boomer Bundy and I have lived in an SRO in Alexander Street since 2016. Danny Aiello is a housing advocate who worked with Boomer. She says he had a home for several years in an SRO or low-cost rental unit. And I feel compelled to express my concerns over the way my most recent landlord has bullied and harassed me for the last year and a half. She encouraged Boomer to write to City Council about an issue advocates say is widespread and would eventually see him homeless again, illegal evictions in order to raise rents. What kind of a toll did it take on him? It was really impacting him. Put him under a ton of stress and then when the landlord locked him out, I, I was really upset. Um, and I had said to him, listen, we can get an order of possession for your room. We can get a monetary order for the distress and the losing your belongings. He, he, just, he, he just didn't want really anything to do with all of that. He was kind of done. Yeah, this is where I live now. And, um, well, you know, you, you, you accept uh, as, as, it, as it comes and as it goes, right? And I don't know, maybe that's what keeps me so young looking. <laughs> That ability to see light in the darkness never really left him, even when he ended up in that closet. Friends worried for him in that isolated room, but Boomer felt secure, though uncertain about what lay ahead. I'm alive, I'm healthy, but uh, I can't see in the possible near future what I'm really going to do. I mean, if you really keep at it, you'll find something, right? You're, you really gotta, you really gotta dig your heels in, though. I have a recovery host that uh, I'm hoping to get into. But and now I want, really want to put my heart into trying to quit, and uh, you know, try to live a normal life, as it were. That life, that normal life, as he called it, never got to happen. A few days after our interview, I came into work and was told that there had been a fire. It was in Boomer's closet. Boomer was inside and he didn't survive. When we got here, emergency crews were gone, but they were already clearing out his room. He ended up alone, just like when he first came here, he was alone. And he made a family here, but when he died, he was by himself. The stories need to be heard. And Boomer's story is so important. He represents me. He represents my children. He represents every person that lives down here. Gosh, Susanna, just a heartbreaking story and one that people down there say is not unique. That's right. This really was a story about one man, but so representative of so many people that we've talked to down here. And it's why advocates were so worried about the de-encampment. While the city says they had to do it for safety reasons, others say it has created new safety concerns, more people falling through the cracks, and the possibility of more deaths like boomers. Susanna De Silva, thank you. Next on the national, production for film and television is in jeopardy as writers continue to strike for a second week. One, two, three, four, stop the strike and pay us more. American writers tell me what it could mean for viewers next. Almost all great comedy starts with great writers. Being a writer is a hard job and it deserves respect. Um, 
and I think the more people respect That's a taste of some of the pre-recorded acceptance messages from actors for the MTV Movie and TV Awards. It was supposed to be a live broadcast, red carpet and everything, until Drew Barrymore pulled out as host in support of striking writers. Now, the Writers Guild of America strike has entered its second week and it's already taken Hollywood off script. As Lindsay Duncombe explains, it's having an impact in Canada too. Just keep swimming. This is Canadian actress Cynthia Joe's demo reel, what she sends to American producers to line up work. Lately though, calls aren't coming. It has been quite slow since the beginning of the year for me in terms of work and just auditions wise. And music? That's because the film and television industry saw the U.S. writers' strike coming and scaled back production plans in advance. It is very, very rough for both me and a lot of my film crew friends who have, you know, basically are unemployed now because there's nothing being written. Canadian productions using Canadian unionized workers aren't affected, but the big money in Canada's film industry comes from south of the border. Will you marry me? ABC's The Good Doctor is set in San Jose, California, but shot on this soundstage in Burnaby, BC. Normally we'd have 150 crew and cast here, and uh, this place would be buzzing. The show was on hiatus now. Its fall return could be delayed if the strike goes on. Writing for new seasons of network TV usually starts around now. This is a U.S. studio and U.S. union issue, so there's nothing we can do. But there, there will be thousands of crew members out of work until we can get scripts again. This is largely happening because of how streaming has upended the film and television industry. Writers for streaming services get one-time payments instead of residuals. Canadian screenwriters say it's the same situation here. We're dealing with a lot of the same issues. Shorter contracts, lower wages, more development work, less work in production. The labor crisis in Hollywood and Hollywood North could get even worse. Unions for American actors and directors may also strike soon. For now, Cynthia Zhou is concentrating on low-budget indie projects and relying on her day job to pay the bills. When she's not acting, she works in tech. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. The writer's strike has upended production in Hollywood and Hollywood North, and sooner or later that's going to have an impact on what viewers actually see. So joining us now, NPR's TV critic Eric Diggins, and from Los Angeles, Brittany Nichols, an actor, comedian, and WGA-affiliated writer. Brittany, let's start with you. Can you help us to understand the strike from the writer's perspective? What are you asking for and why? Sure. Uh, right now we're striking because screenwriting has been devalued by the studios. Writer pay is down and we are looking to add protections to our contract that will allow our profession to continue to exist. The advent of streaming by the studios has become an existential threat to our jobs because the pay model uh, has not changed to meet the new realities of this business and it doesn't allow writers to share in the success of the shows that we work for. And Eric, you know, we're, we're sort of heading into rerun season now. So can you talk about how this conflict actually affects viewers, um, given that, you know, a lot of the writing for new seasons actually starts now? Sure. Um, it may be tough for some viewers to perceive that there's much difference uh, because some of the effects are longer term. Uh, of course, we've seen the late night shows like um, Stephen Colbert's The Late Show and Jimmy Kimmel Live. They stopped production. Saturday Night Live has gone dark. Uh, some uh, daytime shows, The Talk and some soap operas have gone dark. Um, if you try to watch or if you watch the MTV movie and, uh, and, and TV awards on Sunday night, uh, you realize that they, they essentially presented a clip show because the host Drew Barrymore dropped out of doing uh, a live show uh, because she was concerned that the WGA was going to pick it and she didn't want to cross the picket lines and and many other uh, performers and presenters felt the same way. So um, so we there are some uh, obvious effects, but a lot of this is going to be longer term. The, the, the streaming services in particular have a, a long pipeline of material. Uh, uh, Netflix says it can last the entire year. Uh, without worrying about uh, new material. And uh, the broadcast networks have just ended a TV season. 
So while uh, this would affect preparations for next TV season, um, they're winding down their seasons already now. So for viewers, it may take a little while for them to, to notice, but the industry uh, will notice much sooner. Brittany, what's stopping them, these productions, from using Canadian writers or rather writers from other countries? Well, I think what's interesting is that though the studios don't seem to have morals, uh, other people do. And so what we've seen is a strong showing of solidarity from writers unions in other countries. Uh, we've had showings from UK and Canada, and these are people who are, you know, proud of the contracts that the WGA and WGA West, West and East have come up with. They wish that we they had our contracts and they're not going to do anything to weaken us um, because they're still fighting to have the things that we're fighting for. They, we really see this as a fight that's here to benefit so many people in the entertainment industry, not just in America. These are things that can be replicated elsewhere and they don't want to undercut us. I'm sure that what we will see is that we'll see some networks use Canadian TV shows, uh, which happened during the last strike, and which has also kind of been happening in broadcast anyway. Uh, we've seen uh, shows from Canada and Britain imported by um, platforms like AMC and the CW anyway. So I, I imagine we'll see more of that. And I also imagine we'll see more unscripted content. We're, we've already, we're already seeing Dancing with the Stars move from Disney Plus back to ABC. Uh, we've seen some other uh, big unscripted shows announced. Um, so, so you know, we're expecting to see uh, a rise in unscripted, uh, a rise in some foreign shows, but it's still early days. I mean, you know, it, it hasn't even been a week yet. Okay, so Brittany, a lot of them standing in solidarity with you, but can you also talk about, you know, the importance of staying consistent with writers? You're a writer on Abbott Elementary. How, you know, problematic would it be if it was somebody else who stepped in? Well, I, I think it would be a, a pretty different show. <laughs> uh, I mean, you have to consider that the creator of the show is in the WGA. Uh, there is no continuity of the story and the vision that she set out to execute uh, without her. She's striking as well. <laughs> Damn, America does have talent. Of course, I'm going to say that, you know, we want every single writer back and, and able to, to make a living and to make this something that Every writer on every show can continue to show up. And uh, those streamers that are cutting their seasons off after one or two seasons, like you're depriving an audience. When you're not letting creators tell the story as they intend it, you're making the product worse. And we've seen that happen over the past several years. And it will continue to happen if we aren't treated the way that we should be. So, Brittany, why should the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers hurry up and agree on a new contract? Um, because we're going to cause them a lot of pain with this strike. I mean, we're cutting off their pipeline. I, I think that people see writing as something that just happens uh, when you're literally sitting at a computer and typing words onto a screen. Even shows that are in production now that we haven't shut down yet, but uh, probably will, uh, there's writing that goes on while you're shooting that. Everything is rewriting, editing. There are changes and tweaks on the day. The job of a writer is... Uh, something that is present from the moment that the idea happens until it's literally showing up on your screen. So though these shows might get made, the product of them, the quality of that product is diminished because we're not there. And we are cutting off the pipelines for any other shows to get made. And if you want new shows, then, then you should be telling the studios to uh, make a fair uh, proposal to the demands that we want. Brittany, Eric, thank you. Next, a story fit for a movie with a blazing house fire and a group of heroes. Um, by the time we got to the scene here, the house was already engulfed in flames. Running into danger, their brave actions in our moment. You can hear the flames crackling as a Winnipeg home turned into a towering inferno last week with a family trapped inside. Luckily, all five people escaped with their lives. And it was thanks to the quick thinking of a roofing crew rushing towards the flames and pulling people from the blaze. Their courage is our moment. It was uh, just a regular day. Me and Caleb were on the roof. One of my workers noticed the smoke. We started hearing screams from kids, um, especially a girl, loud, very loud screams. As soon as we heard that, I told my guys to go run over there. By the time we got to the scene here, 
the house was already engulfed in flames, we started seeing them, people coming out. The dad was trying to break it with a broom, which wasn't doing the job. I grabbed the hatch and I smashed the rest of the window and then uh, we told him to jump through, so we pulled him out and by the time he got out, there was burns on his feet and everything else. It was a very close call for sure, getting them out of that small window. That's where uh, the window was and that's where we smashed, smashed the window and uh, got them out. There wasn't really any thinking at that point in time for our safety. Um, we were just trying to get those children and whoever else was there out safely. We were very uh, proud, especially because of all the people that were coming up to us, um, telling us we were heroes. We, we really appreciate that, hearing those kind words. As my father was doing roofing for 25 years, I know he would do the same thing, and I know he's proud. He passed away this last month here, and so I'm, I'm very proud I was able to be there. And, and I'm really proud of my guys with what they were able to do, the reactors like that. Um, and those, those times, seconds mean so much. Yeah, I'm sure your father would have been really proud. And thank goodness those roofers by chance were staying late that night. That's the National for May 8th. Thank you for being with us and have a good night.